Good morning. As we come into God's house together this morning, we are met by the awesome presence of our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. And we gather here to worship Him in spirit and in truth. I invite you to use this next space, this next moment of time to continue quieting your hearts and stilling your minds as we enter into the presence of the living God to worship and praise Him. As we are led in special music, this song we gather together. Amen. Well, again, I greet you all in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. On this, the day that the Lord has made a day that we will rejoice and be glad. And welcome to church this morning, whether you are here in person with us or worshiping with us virtually, the welcome is still the same. We are greeted in the faithful and awesome name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And what an honor and privilege it is to worship Him this day. And there's a little holiday coming up later this week. Anybody want to guess what that is? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. All right. And I'm sure you've already been inundated with lots of onslaught for a holiday that's much after Thanksgiving, right? Especially with this news about get your gifts done early, right? Or else they may not get there in time. But it is so good and right for us, especially this morning, uh, to pause and remember why it is that we are thankful for all the blessings that God has given to us. And we certainly want to do that this morning in church together. I have a few announcements I'd like to share. You can find a lot of these on addisville.org. So if you haven't already checked that out in the last few days or weeks, you might want to hop on over there soon um, to find out about what's happening in the life of our church in the days and weeks to come. Um, the other cool thing on addisville.org is if you've been worshiping with us for some time, but we haven't had an opportunity to meet you, uh, we have a new form that you can fill out so we can know who has been worshiping with us. It's under the Get Connected tab, and you can fill in your name and information. We'd love to, to find out more about you and how we can uh, join you in your walk with Jesus Christ. So please fill that out at addisfield.org. There's information as well on addisfield.org about small groups and Bible studies and Sunday schools. Uh, Men to Men is meeting tonight um, in the lounge at 6 p.m. Lois Circle will be meeting tomorrow night. Um, so there's lots of great things to be paying attention to in the days and weeks to come here at Addisfield, especially around Sunday school, Bible studies, and small groups. Maybe you saw a slide already for Operation Christmas Child, but Barb and her team already packed over 300 boxes through the collections that they had from our church family over the past year. So I think certainly let's give the Lord a round of applause for those boxes. 
And if you had your own family box that you still have not brought in, you can bring that in today. She asked for those by noon because then she's going to take those off to the warehouse um, and they'll get shipped off uh, around the world to bless those who are in need of hearing of Christ's love for them all across the world. So we're thankful for that ministry in the life of our church. Uh, speaking of Christmas and this Sunday is Christ the King Sunday, and then next Sunday begins Advent, believe it or not. And so we have some special Advent devotionals um, for all ages that the church has available. We'd love for you to go home with if you're here in person, or you can pick up um, if you're watching with us virtually throughout the week. Um, they'll be on a bench outside of, fellowship, or outside of the Christian Ed office, um, as well as if you're not able to venture out, we would love to send them in the mail to you. Just reach out to us at our hope at Addisville.org, say Advent Devotionals with your address, and we would love to get these in the mail to you. So the first one I'm holding up, it says, Seek Out the Savior. It's an Advent book of devotions, rhymes, seek and find picture puzzles, mainly for kids. Some of you might be saying, well, I'm a kid at heart. Yeah, I see the uh, uproar back there. Um, so that one is specifically for kids or the young at heart. Um, the other one says Advent C, Son, right? S-E-E-S-O-N, C, the Son, C, Jesus. And um, this one's really geared for teens and young adults. Um, and then the last one we have is Our Greatest Gift, A Wonderful Life in Christ. Anybody want to guess what this one might be a riff on? It's a wonderful life. You got it. Anne's excited about that one. Uh, so we, we certainly are excited to, to get these and to bless our church family and encourage you to pick those up or have us mail them to you this week um, so the next Sunday you can begin the season of Advent, spending each day with our Savior Jesus Christ. Just a few other announcements that I have. We had a great first season of prayer walking. Uh, we had our last gathering for the year this past Thursday. We'll take a break. Um, as it was a little chilly, uh, thankfully the, the, the sun was out, but still a little on the chilly side. Um, but we'll certainly be picking that back up in 2021. Uh, if you, though, like to walk and, and really have a heart for your neighborhood or another part of our community, I would love to connect with you and share with you about the opportunity we have to prayer walk, not just in our own neighborhood, neighborhood here at church, but wherever it is that God has placed you, there's an opportunity to, to claim a, a time and a place um, to pray for, for those who are in need. Um, so we're thankful for the many people that were part of our prayer walking ministry so far and look forward to God's blessings on that in the years to come. If I could have a drum roll, please, for our food pantry. All right. And this drum roll comes right from Fred and Grace's email. I don't think I've ever seen so many all capital letters and exclamation points from Grace. 604 pounds of food Addisville raised. That meant two, yeah, absolutely. That meant two trips to the food pantry this week for them. Um, and then just another little note so you guys know the impact that we're having in our community and some of those needs that are taking place right here in, in, in our part of, of Pennsylvania. 17,000 families have been served through Jesus Focus since March. 17,000 families since March. So again, all that food that we're bringing in is going to a, a great place, a ministry that has a heart for Jesus and serving those who are in need. So really thank you from the bottom of my heart and the bottom of everyone's hearts here at Addisville. Thank you for those contributions. They're greatly appreciated. And again, we are so thankful for the ways that you continue to bless and support the ministries that Christ has called us to here at Addisville as well, um, through your giving of your tithes and your offerings. You can place those in the boxes to my right, to your left, right behind um, in the narthex. There's another box there, as well as mailing those in or doing um, online giving. All of those are so, so greatly appreciated, and they go to help support our continued ministry in this place and in our community. Thank you, thank you. Well, as we transition in our service to another opportunity to lift up a song of praise to our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, I want to share some scriptures with you this morning. The first one is Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. It is he that made us, and we are his. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name, for the Lord is good. 
His steadfast love endures forever. His faithfulness to all generations. And actually, before I hop into the next verse, I'm seeing Aunt Harford giving me, don't forget my wife's eyes. And I have another announcement to share from Bonnie Drexler real quick <laughs> that I printed out and forgot to read. <laughs> this is for Angel Tree. Um, you saw an announcement that said that Angel Tree was already all done, but she got, Bonnie got word that there's one more family that's in need of some presents. So if God puts that on your heart, you can sign up at addisfill.org. Um, there's a link there to click on Angel Tree or contact Bonnie Drexler. She'd love to get you in contact with that. So thank you for those kind eyes, Hartford, reminding me through that mask. <laughs> Don't forget about Bonnie's uh, Angel Tree announcement. Uh, thank you for all the gifts that got picked up so quickly. There's one more that's in need. Um, so we'd love to get that taken care of uh, before the day is done. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Enter his courts with praise. Worship him. Know that he is God. He is faithful in every season, at every time, and in every place. Psalm 95, verse 2 says this, Let us come before His presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to Him with psalms. Let us come before His presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to Him with psalms. Let us come before Him with thanksgiving. Henry Alford wrote this hymn that we were about to sing together. Come, ye thankful people, come. He wrote it in 1844, and he wrote it with this psalm on his heart. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. Henry was a powerful preacher, a deep man of faith, serving the people of his town faithfully, teaching them the truth of God's word, and helping them to learn the practice of giving thanks to the Lord in all things and in every season. This hymn was written for the English Harvest Festival and it gives testimony to God's faithfulness and to God's provision. And as we sing together, may we too be a thankful people as we sing the words of this hymn together. Take stock of your own heart, those own places that you have opportunity to give thanks to God for His love, for His care, for His salvation in His Son, Jesus Christ, for the gift of family and friends and the many blessings that we have. Come, ye thankful people, come into the presence of our faithful Savior and worship Him together this day. Let's sing with one another.
may be seated. And will you join me in prayer? Lord Jesus, we come into your presence with thanksgiving in our hearts, and we enter your courts with praise. We say this is the day that you have made, and we rejoice and we are glad in it. You, Jesus, give us life and breath and being, and you preserve us by your righteous right hand. Thank you, Lord, for never letting us go. And we pause to give you thanks and to lift up the many places in each of our hearts and in all of our lives that we have opportunity to be thankful. And we ask, Lord, that as we reflect on these things now, that they will draw us closer into, into your presence, into a heart and spirit of, of thanksgiving. Not just for this day and this week ahead, but that we truly would be a, a people of thanksgiving day in and day out. A people who are animated from the tips of our toes to the tops of our heads with thankfulness and joy and gratitude and love for you and for each other. Thank you, Lord, for calling us your own, for blessing us beyond our wildest imaginations, and for the opportunity always to give you thanks and praise. And one way that we give you thanks and praise, Lord, is the fact that you hear all of our prayers, every single one. Those said out loud in a time and place like this where we share the prayers of your people. Prayers said out loud in places of deep distress and uncertainty. As well as the quiet prayers of our hearts. And silent whispers. Even when we don't know what to pray, you hear all of these things and are interceding on our behalf. And we are so thankful that you are our God and you hear us and you long to be close to us. So we lift up now prayers for those in our church family who are sick and in need of healing. We pray for Bob and Mary Ann, for Cass, Lord Jesus, for Melinda, for Larry, for Matt. For Richie, Suzanne, for Loy, we lift up Pat who asks prayers for continued favor on him in a season of his life, Jesus, where you are drawing him close. And we pray for Pat. Lord, we lift up continued prayers for those who are battling COVID-19 and we pray for their health and for their strength and their recovery. We boldly cry out for an end to this virus. And we lift up prayers of comfort and sustenance for the many changes that we are facing to traditions and family gatherings this year at Thanksgiving. Help us, Lord, to turn to you in this time. And again, to lift up our hearts in gratitude because of your faithfulness to us, even in the midst of this stormy season. Lord, we pray for those around the world who are facing all sorts of struggles, from war and destruction, and we pray Two, for the people of Honduras. As yet another hurricane this year has ripped apart this country. Jesus, we pray for your comfort and for your peace and the mighty power of your protection and deliverance even now. Lord, we pray for our nation and we lift up prayers for our leaders at every single level of government, Lord. And we pray for your wisdom and for your justice and mercy to be upon them as they govern us. And we pray that they will turn to you for their wisdom alone. Jesus, again, we are thankful that you hear all of our prayers and that you answer us when we call. We're so thankful that Pastor Doug is here with us this week in person. We're thankful for the technology that you have given to us to hear him virtually We pray your blessing on the words you have placed on his heart to share with us this morning. Lord, bless him and bless each of us as we dwell together in your word. We pray this in your name, Jesus, saying the prayer you've taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. 
and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the Thought I had it this time. <laughs> so I hear you heard the battle of the lawnmowers last week, huh? <laughs> yeah, interesting times when neighbors decide to cut their grass. <laughs> it, is, it is good to be back here this week and to be with you in the house of the Lord, with God's people. As we continue our series, of mes- our series of messages from the book of Genesis, and uh, we're, we're winding down. Uh, next week, we'll be wrapping this series up, so um, looking forward to the time we can spend in God's Word looking at these uh, fascinating characters that we're getting to know maybe a little bit better. So this morning, we're going to be looking at Genesis chapter 37, and we're looking, uh, starting at verse 1, we'll, look, we'll read the first part of this chapter. Hear now the word of the Lord. Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age, and he made an ornate robe for him. And when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright, while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His brothers said to him, Do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dreams and what he had said. Then he had another dream, and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said. I had another dream, and this time the sun and moon and eleven stars were bowing down to me. And when he told his father as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. And may God bless the reading of this, his holy and inspired word to our hearts and lives. Amen. And amen. Well, Alice Grayson of Tuscaloosa, Alabama, had to bake a cake for her church's bake sale. And to be honest, she had forgotten about it until the last moment. Last minute, that morning of, it was due. And she remembered it, and she went around the house looking for something to, to bake a cake with, found some uh, angel's food cake mix. And while she was washing her hair, you know, getting it ready and, and then getting dressed and then trying to get her son ready for Boy Scout camp, in the, in the middle of all that, she was also trying to bake this cake. And she took it out of the oven, and to her horror, the entire middle section had flattened. It's flat. It looked, the cake looked terrible. She didn't have time to bake another cake, and she didn't know what to do. And she was new to the church. She was trying to fit in. She had promised to bring a cake for the cake sale. So she went around the house looking for something to put into the cake to kind of fill it out. And she found the perfect thing. It fit perfectly, a roll of toilet paper. So she stuck it in the cake and covered it over with icing. And when she was done, the cake looked absolutely beautiful. It looked perfect. It really did. So while she was taking the cake to church and then she had to go to work, she woke her daughter Amanda up and said, listen, you have to be there at that church as soon as the doors open, 930 for the uh, cake sale, because I want you to buy this cake. I don't want anybody to get a cake with toilet paper in it. So um, her daughter uh, got over there. By the time she got there, the cake in question had been sold. It was gone. 
And Alice was absolutely horrified. She just didn't know what to do about it. She thought, what are they going to think of me when they bite into this cake and they find toilet paper? This is terrible. Didn't know what to do. So the next day, it turned out that she was going to a luncheon bridal shower at the home of a friend of a friend. And this, this person that was hosting this party was a bit of a snob and came from one of the founding families of Tuscaloosa and told you that over and over again. So she really didn't want to go, but she already had RSVP, so she felt um, obligated to go to this. So she went, the meal was elegant, the, the uh, guests were definitely upper crust, southern, old south. Everything was great until dessert, when dessert was brought out and it was her cake. And she was absolutely mortified. And she got out of her chair to tell the hostess, um, you can't serve this cake. When the mayor's wife commented, what a beautiful cake. And before Alice could get over there, the hostess, who was a prominent member of her church, with a voice of pride said, thank you, I baked it myself. <laughs> to which... Alice sat down in her chair and thought, God is good. <laughs> well, I really love it when deserving people get a double portion of divine justice. I probably like it more than I really should, and you probably do too. We enjoy that when we see that. Well, today as we continue this series of sermons, it's actually winding down towards the end of it, we come to the story, we come to the history of Joseph. And this story is where the Genesis narrative takes an unexpected and somewhat of a disconcerting turn. It really does. Because up to this point, we've seen characters go through difficult times, and you really can't say they don't deserve it, <laughs> because they do. In fact, I personally think that at times God was very gracious to them because they got off easier than they should have. I mean, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they could all be boneheaded and, and stubborn and rebellious. And they each paid a price for it, but really in the end of it, it always seemed that the bread kept landing butter side up for them. God was patient with them again and again and again, and they kept what they would keep screwing up again and again. And so finally they got it and they start being obedient to God's commands and they started trusting in his promises and going down the path that, that the Lord wanted them to go down. And then we get to Joseph. And if you're keeping score, Joseph is just better. He's better than they are. He seems to have more resolve. He seems to have more character. He seems to have more integrity. In fact, there's only really one thing you can fault Joseph for, and it's relatively small. We'll get to it in a couple of minutes. But in the previous message, the story of Jacob, it ends with him finally arriving in the land of Canaan, back to the home of his father Isaac and his grandfather Abraham. He makes peace with his brother Esau, and when he arrives back home, he then builds an, an altar to worship God, the God who had been faithful and who had been with him the entire time. God had been so good and, and so faithful to Jacob. Then shortly after this, his wife Rachel gives birth to Benjamin, Jacob's 12th son. And it was a hard labor. And sadly, Rachel does not survive. And as you remember, she was his favorite. So he builds a monument to her memory. Now Jacob has a tendency to play favorites with his sons. And Joseph, who is at this point now a teenager, he's the favored one. And Jacob's very obvious about this. In fact, it says, picking up in verse 3, Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other children because Joseph had been born to him in his old age. So one day, Jacob had a special gift made for Joseph, a beautiful robe, but his brothers hated Joseph because their father loved him more than the rest of them. They couldn't say a kind word to him. You see, what Jacob is doing, he is sowing seed that is going to come back and is going to bite him. Uh, 
in other words, I mean, this whole story is really a warning to us parents about the perils of favoritism and what damage it can do in, a, in children's lives. Uh, but that's another, <laughs> that's another sermon for another day. We can't go down that path right now. So Joseph had a dream one night. Now, dreams play a really major role in this young man's life. In fact, he, he's gifted. God has given him a gift in, in interpreting dreams. And so when he tells his brother the dreams, the Bible says they despise him even more. So this is what he says. It's recorded in verse 7, chapter 37. We were out in the field tying up bundles of grain. Suddenly my bundle stood up and your bundles all gathered around and bowed low before mine. And his brothers are like, what are you trying to tell us? That we're, that we're going to serve you someday? Then he has another dream. And in this dream... He sees the sun and the moon and 11 stars, which coincidentally is the number of brothers that he has, and they're all bowing before him. And he tells his, his brothers about this, and then he tells his father, Jacob, about the dream. And Jacob is like, are you telling me that your mother and brothers and I are going to bow before you? And his brothers hate him. If it is possible, they hate him even more. But Jacob is pondering what do these dreams mean? What could they possibly mean? Now, I said that Joseph doesn't really do anything wrong, but this is, his, this is his mistake. He probably should have kept his dreams to himself. Um, you know, he was a teenager, but still. Because all he's doing is an antagonizing his brothers by telling them about these dreams, about them being his servants. And by the way, spoiler alert, these all come to pass down the road. Everything that he says comes to pass. So finally, Joseph's brothers decide that enough is enough. We've had enough of this, this kid. I mean, not only is he telling them about his dreams, the Bible also says that he has a habit of reporting back to his father when they do something bad. So he's a bit of a snitch, and he's also a show-off. So they, so they decide they're going to take care of this once and for all. They're going to kill him. And they put their plan into motion. Now, again, this is hard to believe, but this is a reoccurring theme that we see throughout the book of Genesis. It happens with Cain and Abel. It happens with Jacob and Esau. And now we see it happening with Jacob's sons who are ready to take Joseph's lives. You know, brother against brother. See that again and again. And their plan is to kill him and to throw him into a deep water tank. And to tell Jacob that, that his son was killed by wild animals. And they're like, this will finally put an end to his dreams. Now, his brother Reuben comes to his defense, sort of. You know, he's like, we don't need to actually kill him. We can just throw him down into the water tank, and eventually he'll die. Reuben says this because he's planning on coming back and rescue him, the Bible says. So the brothers take his fancy robe. Apparently, he liked wearing his technicolor dream coat wherever he went. Daddy gave it to him, probably did nothing to help his relationship with his brothers. And then they take that coat from him, and then they toss him into an empty well. And just about that time, a caravan of slave traders come along, and Brother Judah comes up with a brilliant idea. Instead of hurting him, let's just sell him to the Ishmaelites. You may recall the Ishmaelites, they were the half-brother of Isaac, so they're actually related. So the brothers pull Joseph out of the well, and they say, in effect, uh, good news, little brother, we're not going to kill you. Instead, we're going to give you to, to these guys. You belong to them. And so the brothers sell Joseph for 20 shekels of silver. And then they pour goat's blood on the colorful robe, and they go back and they tell their father Jacob that Joseph had been attacked and did not survive. And Jacob is inconsolable. I mean, just imagine, they tell, they tell their father that their brother had been eaten alive. That's really what they tell him. That's what he, 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 he's able to conclude from what they're saying. Now, meanwhile, <laughs> the Ishmaelites take Joseph to Egypt, where he is sold to a high-ranking official, a man named Potiphar, 
And Joseph works in Potiphar's household. And the Bible says, chapter 39, verse 2, the Lord was with Joseph, so he succeeded in everything he did as he served in the home of his Egyptian master. Potiphar noticed this and realized that the Lord was with Joseph, giving him success in everything he did. So the Bible says that he makes Joseph his personal attendant, his right-hand man, gives him complete administrative responsibility over his entire household, takes care of everything. In fact, the Bible says the only thing that Potiphar had to worry about was what he was going to eat because Joseph took care of everything else. Well, actually, there was something else that Potiphar needed to worry about, and that was Mrs. Potiphar. <laughs> because Mrs. Potiphar has a wandering eye. It says in chapter 39, verse 6, Joseph was a very handsome and well-built young man, and Potiphar's wife soon began to look at him lustfully. Come and sleep with me, she demanded. Joseph refuses her advances, saying to her, Potiphar has been good to me. I could, never, I could never do this. And he goes on to say in verse 9, how could I do such a wicked thing? It would be a great sin against God. But Mrs. Potiphar doesn't take no for an answer. She tries again and again and again, and Joseph does everything he can to try to avoid her, but she doesn't give up. And one day she grabs him and he tears himself away from her and he runs out of the house but leaves a torn piece of his cloak behind. And later when her husband comes home, she, she tells him, and this is recorded in, starting in verse 17, that Hebrew slave you brought into our house tried to come in and fool around with me, she said, and when I screamed he ran outside leaving his cloak with me. Now, quite naturally, Potiphar is enraged. He wastes no time throwing Joseph into prison in where all the king's prisoners are kept. And once again, through no fault of his own, Joseph is on the receiving end of the most in in inhumane treatment imaginable. Tossed aside by his brothers, sold as a slave, and now wrongfully accused of the worst kind of wrongdoing. He doesn't deserve it. And still the prison door clangs shut. And he is to remain there for the rest of his life. Now the story doesn't end there, and probably most of you know how the story ends. But for today, this is just about where we're going to end. Because I want you to feel something for a moment. I want you to feel Joseph's pain. I want you to feel the injustice. I want you to feel that sense of abandonment that he must have experienced. This isn't where the story ends, but in that moment, it could have been. Joseph could have thought that this might be the final chapter in his all-too-brief life. You know, we want to live in a world where good things happen to good people, and we can accept the fact that sometimes good things happen to bad people, but we have a hard time understanding why terrible things happen to someone so good. It isn't fair. It isn't right. Where's God? Why does He allow it to happen? Why doesn't He do something? And as much as I would like to answer those last couple of questions, I can't. No one can. We live in a fallen world where sin has a mighty stronghold in the hearts of many people. And sometimes injustice reigns, at least for a season. Now the Bible does tell us that a day will come when all the wrongs will be made right and where justice will rule and in some situations, we can see justice served here and now with our own eyes. But other times, we are left waiting for the day, the day when God will set everything right. And so as Joseph languished in the prison, I don't believe he knew for sure how the events of his life were going to turn out. But I do believe that Joseph found tremendous strength in some fundamental beliefs, some 
fundamental convictions of what it means to walk with God, to know God, to love God. And today in the time that we have left remaining, I want to take just a few moments and I want us to take a look at those fundamental beliefs that sustained him during this most difficult time in his life. I want to share a few of them. One is, it is better to pay the price for doing good than to be rewarded for doing wrong. It is better to be punished for good behavior than to be praised for bad behavior. Now, we live in a culture where sometimes <laughs> that gets switched around and turned upside down. Now, if Joseph had been willing to do wrong, he could have earned the favor of a very powerful woman. It could have advanced his career. Who knows? But he refused to play the game. He refused to take the risk. And the result is that Joseph pays the price for doing good. He pays the same price that so many do who seek to do good. He is wrongly accused. When the enemy of our souls, when Satan seeks to target believers with the intention of taking them down, his strategy is never to accuse the person of being good, to accuse the person of being righteous. No, the enemy's strategy is to discredit this person. How can I distort the truth? How can I fabricate details to destroy this person's reputation? Wrongful accusation is the lifeblood of any oppressive movement. Why? Because it keeps you living in absolute fear. And this is why Jesus encourages us to remember Matthew 5 and verse 11 and 12. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. When I was a new Christian, I remember reading a book entitled The Normal Christian Life. It was written by Watchman Nee. Now, you may be, some of you, a lot of you maybe never heard of Watchman Nee. I consider Watchman Nee one of the greatest Christian leaders of the 20th century. He was an amazing man. From the 1920s to the 1950s, he traveled throughout China, winning converts, discipling new believers, planting churches. And then he fell into disfavor with the Chinese Communist Party, and they came for him. And Watchman Nee was arrested. But was he arrested for being like Jesus? Was he arrested for helping people? <laughs> no. Like so many Christian workers in China back then and to this day, he was charged with a number of unlikely crimes, including bribery, tax invasion, and theft of government information. And he was sent to prison where he spent the last 20 years of his life. Now, the perspective of history allows us to see through the deceitful actions of the Chinese Communist Party. And in fact, I just want to make you alert to the fact that Today, right this moment, the level of persecution is growing ever more intense in China, and we need to be covering the believers in China in prayer. It is, they're in a very difficult time right now, and they need our prayers and our support. And so many of them today are being accused falsely of things, and they are never vindicated. Now, Joseph could have died in, in prison with everyone thinking that he was guilty of the worst kind of assault, but he would rather pay the price for doing right than being rewarded for doing wrong. And that is why his story is still told today. Now here's another fundamental belief that sustained Joseph throughout his difficult days. And it's this. That even when a situation seems out of control, God still controls the current. He still controls the current. You know, I've, I've seen all three Godfather movies, and I have to say, my favorite one is number one. That is the best Godfather movie. And I also remember, and probably started watching it when, it when it first came on, I think I was still in high school, Barney Miller. How many of you remember Barney Miller? Yeah. <laughs> you are definitely dating yourself, remembering Barney Miller. 
I think that show came on in like 1975, which is unbelievable to me. But, they had, but those two things, Godfather 1 and Barney Miller had a common denominator, and that was Abe Vigoda. In fact, I think I asked Dave to show you a picture. Maybe you don't know who Abe Vigoda is. You might recognize that. Even if you're not sure who that is, you might recognize that face. I won't say it was a face only a mother could, could love, but you know. But <laughs> you know, Abe Vigoda was, pl- <clears throat> was playing an old man even before he was an old man. I, I, he had, I think he had, hadn't even turned 50 yet when he was playing... Uh, Sergeant Fish was ready to retire. In 1982, People Magazine reported that he was dead. In 1987, a news reporter referred to him as the late A. Vigoda. Now, Vigoda took all these claims in his stride, and in fact, it became a running joke for him. In spite of that, that fact, he just kept on living his life. He had a very long and productive career right up to 2016, when Abe finally did indeed pass away. You know, the Bible is filled with stories of people who were written off. People like Nehemiah building the walls of Jerusalem, and critics are saying, now he's not a good leader, and this project is doomed to fail. And you have people like the Apostle Paul, you know, people, critics misrepresenting his doctrines and rejoicing when, when he's placed in prison. But you know what? That didn't stop Paul. He kept on preaching, discipling, planting churches, serving the Lord. From time to time, there might be one or two people who are ready to pronounce on you that your ideas are dead on arrival. And there's only one way to prove them wrong. Take it in stride. Keep showing up. Keep plugging away. When you get knocked down, get back up and wipe the dust off. Because it's not what they say that matters or or even what they think that matters. What matters is what you do. And sometimes God will say, in effect, I want you to pack your bags and go to a new place, like he did with Abraham. And sometimes God will allow the circumstances of a situation to take you to the place where you need to be. That's why... Joseph is in Egypt, and we'll talk about that next week because of a worldwide famine. God uses the circumstances to lead Joseph to the place where he needed to be. But here's what I want to make clear so there's no confusion. God did not create the crisis in Joseph's life. When Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery and when Potiphar's wife brought false allegations against him, he was in no way pleased with them. God did not create the crisis in Joseph's life. But here's what I want us to understand. He's able to control it. You may have been victimized at some point in your life, maybe wrongfully accused, maybe taken advantage of. Maybe you were cheated or bullied or fired without cause, and on and on and on. And I want you to know that God did not create the crisis that you may be facing. He did not create it but he can control it. He didn't cause a situation, but he can redeem it. A verse I'm sure that a lot of us know by heart, Romans 8, 28. We know in all things that God works for the good for those who love him who are called according to his purpose. If circumstances are going against you, try not to give in to the temptation to shake your fist and, and blame God for it. Because he didn't do it. But he can, he can control the situation. And he can redeem your suffering. And so as Joseph languished in prison, not sure of what might happen next, one thing he knew, he knew that God wasn't to blame. He knew that the situation seemed out of control. But he knew that God controlled the current. And that brings me to the third fundamental belief that we see defining the life of Joseph. That no amount of injustice can separate you from God's favor. You know, I said a few minutes ago that the story almost ends here. Almost, but not quite. It almost ends with the clanging of the prison doors and 
Joseph spending the rest of his life in a musty underground cell. That's almost where the story ends today. But here, Joseph is in the worst imaginable situation, and what happens? What do you think happens? Chapter 39, verse 21 says, starts, But while Joseph was there in the prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. You know, you've heard of people who can't win for losing. (laughs) Every break they get seems to go, you know, turn on them. Well, Well, Joseph's the opposite. He can't lose for winning. I mean, talk about your bread always landing butter side up. I mean, gee. He gets into a terrible situation, no way out, and then he manages to rise to the top. Well, of course, it's not somehow. It's clear why this keeps happening. Because God is with Joseph, and Joseph is with God. And you know what? Joseph remains faithful no matter what comes his way. He does. He is faithful when he's sold into slavery and loaded into a caravan driven by Ishmaelites. He is faithful when he becomes a top administrator of Potiphar's entire household. And he is faithful when he is unjustly accused by a vindictive woman and thrown into a prison cell. He remains faithful. You know, at any point, he could have compromised his principles. He could have abandoned his cherished beliefs. He could have. He could have succumbed to the evil intentions of others very easily. I think most of us would understand how that could be possible. But he doesn't. He remains faithful. So that even in prison where he would surely spend the rest of his life, he's able to experience God's favor and God's anointing. Listen, this is what I want you to know. That there is no dark that is too dark for the light of God to find you. There is no mistreatment that you can endure, no injustice that can come your way that will separate you from God's love and from his favor. Wherever you are today, God's favor can find you and he can bless you in the midst of the most unseemly situations. Joseph built his life upon these fundamental beliefs. And those beliefs sustained him through the most difficult, dire circumstances. But you know, it's interesting really that each belief really is dependent upon the other. Joseph was able to experience the favor of God in a prison cell because he had decided that being thrown in prison for doing good was better than being rewarded for doing wrong. If doing right means paying a price, well, then so be it, because he'd rather be right with God. Why? Because he knew that God controlled the the currents of his life. The enemy may create one crisis after another, and the situation may seem to be spinning out of control, but God still controls the current. He didn't create the crisis that you face, but he has the power to redeem it. So stay faithful to him. And while God is at work redeeming your situation, only he can. bless you, and show his favor to you where you are, even in the midst of the pain and the mess. Life, even at its worst, cannot cannot separate you from the love of God. You know, I copied this on Facebook this week. I actually received it from a friend, and I loved it so much that I, I copied it. And it says, we fall, we break. We fail, but with Jesus, we rise, we heal, we overcome. Amen. Will you please join me in prayer? Let's pray. Father in heaven, you are so good, Lord, and you are able to shine your light in, even into the, the darkest of places, the loneliest of places, Lord. And so, Father, I pray for anyone today. Maybe they're sitting in the sanctuary or in the fellowship hall or 
watching online, Lord, wherever, God, if they, they just find themselves, Father, in a place where they're, maybe they feel betrayed or maybe they are struggling with a sense of injustice or maybe just struggling with abandonment, feeling abandoned, feeling forsaken, maybe lost, maybe alone. Father, I just want to pray for them today. That I pray, Lord, that in the midst of this great difficulty that they are going through, that they may see your hand, that they may feel your presence, that they may know your love and that gentle peace that only you can bring, Lord. That you will reveal yourself to them, maybe in a way they have never known you before. And I pray this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, amen and amen. Well, certainly in this season, we have a lot to be thankful for. Even in the, st- in the midst of the storms of life, we have much to be thankful for. So grateful for, our st- for the standing stones leading us in our closing song, My Heart is Filled with Thankfulness. Amen. You'll notice we have some wonderful, handsome ushers that are in the front. So we, what we'd like to ask is, as we, we dismiss you after the, the uh, benediction, um, they, they'll dismiss you row by row, so we go out in an orderly uh, manner. So thank you so much. 
And now, my dear friends, as you leave this place, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. And you're lying down and you're rising up in your labor and your leisure, in your laughter and in your tears until that day when we will stand before Jesus on that day in which there is no dawning and no sunset. Amen. Go in peace. Have a blessed day. And I wish you all a very happy Thanksgiving. Nice job, Standing Stones. Beautiful.